Hi, everyone. Welcome back to this first ever Beyond Clean and First Case collaboration event. It's Mission Control, Standing Up to Superbugs and SSIs. I'm Melanie Perry, your First Case co-host and team member from Beyond Clean. And I'd like to give a special thank you to our event sponsor, 3M, for supporting today's educational event. Their dedication to your education is what helped make today's event possible. Our next speaker, Dr. Adam Rosen, is an orthopedic surgeon at Scripps Clinic Medical Group. He specializes in the treatment of knee arthritis and performing total knee replacements and complex revisions. Dr. Rosen is also the host of Your Knee, Your Health and Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcasts. Through his podcasts, he offers health and wellness tips as well as offers orthopedic trainees virtual fellowship experiences. What are the common orthopedic instrumentation sterility issues that arise in SPD? How do these issues impact the safety of surgical care? Today, Dr. Rosen will offer a surgeon's perspective on the infection risks associated with orthopedic instrumentation. Get ready to hear how you can prevent SSIs and improve the safety of orthopedic instruments in your healthcare facility today. So join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Rosen. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for spending your Saturday with us for a little bit. I was uh, very happy to actually get asked by um, by Hank and Brett to come and talk to everybody here. And actually first thought, you know, what do you want to learn from me or what can I offer to you? And I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, you know, in, in this lecture series, there's a lot of people in SBD and vendors, you know, and what can a surgeon offer and, and what experience does, does he have? So um, like Melanie was saying, um, this is me. Um, I work here in, in La Jolla. I'm a, a fellowship trained joint replacement specialist. And um, like she was also saying, I have these podcasts and that's where I think um, Hank had first heard of me and, and reached out to me. Where is my experience and, and a little bit about where I came from and my, my expertise with SPD, which I think might be different from some of the other doctors or surgeons that you work with. I really have to take that way back to medical school um, and I worked with some people as a back tech, and they really taught me how the instruments work and, and how the trays come out and how they go to SPD and how things get cleaned and even how to open and wrap. So it's really surprising for a lot of people. I think I'm only one of two surgeons in our hospital that actually is in the room, and I open every single case with our team. So I'm opening up our blue wraps, I'm checking the filters, I'm looking for BioBird, I'm looking for holes. So I am aware right away if there's any issue and breakdown with BioBird or sterility. Um, and that helps me understand where in the process these issues arise. So when people are kind of curious, well, why do you have these short turnovers? Well, because I'm in the room. Um, and when people say, well, the other surgeons aren't really complaining about issues with bio burden, we don't hear it from them. It's, it's typically because they're in the lounge and they're just waiting to be called. So they just know that their case turnover was delayed. So, you know, I'm in the room and I'm seeing this stuff. So this isn't just uh, talking about it from the backside. So what am I looking for? Every single case, I'm looking for everything. You know, confirmation of sterility is key. So if we have breakdown of the drapes, that's an issue. But in the beginning, I'm looking for all the things that we deal with when it comes to orthopedic issues. So bone, cement, holes in the drapes, you know, hair, which, you know, I, when I talk to patients or talk to people and they're like, hair? Yeah, hair. Hair can actually come up also. Um, you know, and, and why is all of this important? Well, our big thing as a surgeon and anybody involved in healthcare with patient care is to prevent surgical site infections. And people don't realize this, I think, sometimes on the back end, like how important everybody's job is throughout this entire process, because studies show that if you get a total joint replacement that does develop an infection, the total cost on the healthcare system is almost $100,000. And that person that came in with arthritis and thought, I'm going to get my knee replaced and get back to playing golf and playing with my grandkids, now has one or more surgeries ahead of them. They typically go on IV antibiotics for six or eight weeks. And then they have an increased morbidity and mortality. And these people have increased risks of issues with the knee itself. It may be chronically stiff. It may be chronically painful. So we really have one chance to get this right. 
And when I go down this path, if somebody gets an infection, some people are curious, well, what actually happens? And a lot of people think we just put them on antibiotics, like if you cut your finger. But no, these implants have to be taken out. You know, so on the top left of your screen, you see these knee replacements and the right knee, which is the one to your left, is the one that was infected. So that comes out and an antibiotic spacer goes in, which is the picture at the bottom. That's not super functional. And that's a big problem. Sometimes we can place a new implant and basically change everything at the first stage and put a new implant in. But again, still, it's not great. And if that doesn't work and the bone gets infected, what you see on this last picture is we've had to chop out a huge segment of that person's femur and put this hinge in which allows them to stand and walk, but it's not very functional. It's not the knee replacement that the person came in for expecting to get back to a good quality of life. So when we go down this path, the idea of, you know, bio burden, hair and all of this stuff, you know, I kind of really thought about it as this trip walking down the yellow brick road. We're walking through the hospital. You got Dorothy and the scarecrow and the lion and the tin man. And we're trying to defeat this evil, wicked witch. This is the bio burden. This is the surgical site infection. So we have to know where it all comes from. In orthopedics, you know, we're dealing with saws, we're dealing with drills, we're dealing with sharp punches, we're adding cement, the polymethyl methacrylate. It's limited working time, we're moving quickly, so you might be putting instruments in and out of the wound, and cement may be on a piece, and if you put it away and you're not aware of it, and then it gets into the sterile processing department and they don't catch it, and it comes back onto the next tray. And the instruments that we use, they're not smooth. You know, a lot of these are roughened on purpose so we can prepare the bone. And even with fracture stuff, we have a lot of drill bits that are cannulated. So it's an easy place where pins or bone can get incarcerated. And if that's not caught, that can lead to problems down the road with sterility. So these are just a few examples over the years. So this is an ask lap panel left, you know, and bone was stuck somewhere. So as that got sterilized and it got lifted out, bone was in the tray. So that tray is contaminated. The middle view you see, this is cement that is attached to one of the retractors. Again, stuck on there, whole back tables open, the entire thing's contaminated, has to go away. And then also knowing your instruments. Uh, This instrument here is a reamer. So that piece gets slid back so the reamer or um, grater can get put on the back end, but bone got incarcerated in there wasn't noticed, wasn't cleaned properly, came back in the sterile instruments. Now that set is contaminated. So you have to know what the frequent offenders are. And this is where, you know, I team up with the four people walking down this road. You know, you got the surgeon, and I'll let you kind of choose like, you know, who who each character is in the Wizard of Oz, but you got a surgeon and you have your back techs, your OR techs, you have SPD, but you also have your reps. And these orthopedic reps can be really, really helpful. So I really ingrained, you know, having this idea of creating your sort of FBI most wanted list. So if you had a set of hip instruments, which you see on the left, a lot of times the techs may know. And if your hospital doesn't have techs and SPD merge or some places cross cover. So the techs, when they're working in SPD, understand quite well which instruments are the offenders because they're opening trays and checking. But if SPD is removed from the tax, is getting the reps involved. So you know that the punch and the, the cannulated issues, the reamers, the T-handles, the brooches, the drill bits, the reamers, they're all spots where bone may get stuck. So if you have that, somebody in SPD is looking more carefully and closely, oh, oh in this huge set of 50 instruments, I need to look more carefully at these things. And then on the right, you have a knee replacement set. So you have issues, again, with the roughened, um, punches and things that we use to remove cement so your freer elevators but even those black instruments the impactors commonly can get cement stuck on them so looking for those things before they just get thrown back and taken back to spd at the end of the case is a way for people to prevent the issue of bio burden coming down the lane now holes are a big thing too so we have to worry about holes and again why you know you're wondering what we're dealing with so we're dealing with sharp instruments you know we're dealing with t handles we're dealing with brooches we're dealing with big trays and sometimes they have these corners so you have to be aware of you know if something has to be peel packed making sure that it's not sharp or if it is sharp and has to be peel packed that those things have some type of protective cover and looking back at your holes and figuring out if they're occurring, why and where in the process, where in the chain. Because again, I'm in the room, I'm opening these trays with my team, lifting them up, checking through the light. 
and looking and seeing where in the process this is happening. So for certain trays in the orthopedic world, some of them actually come with pre-designed corners that are rounded and cushioned. You know, if not, you might use plastic or foam that we've used from time to time for certain trays. And then where do, do, where do you store these in SPD? You know, do you store these on wire racks? That was an issue we had many, many years ago. There's a lot of the wire racks, the way they were being pulled and pushed, because as you know, a lot of these trays can be quite heavy, especially in the spine world. Um, and if they're getting pulled and dragged across these wire racks, that's another spot where you can add into holes and what type of drapes, so that they reinforce drapes or not. Um, with the peel packed items, again, you have to be smart because if we say, hey, this has to be peel packed for the case, but the person peel packing, it doesn't realize it's a sharp instrument, that's not peel packed correctly. So it has to be padded or protected, or maybe they should be put in trays and wraps. So you have to know what you're dealing with because again, if you get it into the operating room and there's a hole and it's not caught and there's risk of infection, surgical site infection, you know, now the patient's health is compromised. Now this is kind of the beautiful thing where we went away from a lot of wraps and went to a lot more of the Ascolat pans and the hard trays. And the one thing that I was really um, impressed by years ago were the idea of these cubes. And the cubes are great because you know it gets rid of the issue of these wraps and holes you know, the problem is, though, if you do have buyer burden, you know, then everything in the cube is compromised. The nice thing about it, we trialed the, the turbot. It was at one of the other hospitals in our system, so I had the, um, the chance to trial one of these. And it was really, really nice because one filter. So as far as being environmentally conscious, you know, there's one filter versus tons of blue wraps because we've got the orthopedic tray. And then we have three to five trays depending on a hip or knee set and what other instruments we may use. And the other idea is efficiency. You know, so if I'm in the room and unwrapping and another tech or nurse is unwrapping and we're moving trays and you know, the, the OR tech that's already scrubbed in is moving stuff back and forth, that's a lot of stuff that we're all doing together versus the idea of come in, take the tray off, check the filter. We could be doing other stuff at the same time, getting the patient ready while the person that's already scrubbed in is opening and setting everything up all by themselves. So it is one of those things that I thought was really, really nice. I haven't had the chance to work with Stericube. Um, so the one that we had was uh, the Turb, but just having that experience there. So it's something that I really hope that um, our hospital takes on because it definitely seemed like a huge efficiency model. And, you know, again, carbon footprint. So this is one case. This is one of my total knee replacement cases. So you got an entire trash bag just full of the trash from opening, you know, plus all the stuff at the end and the drapes versus if you could eliminate one of those whole trash bags and you look at the you know millions of total joint replacements that we do in the US per year, that's a lot. I mean, this is data from Practice Green Health, 5 million tons of waste per year that is produced by hospitals. That's 29 pounds of waste per bed per day. Um, so you know, going to something like the Turbid or Stericube from my standpoint is a great way to reduce our carbon footprint and as well as you know, keep a, our risk of surgical site infection down. Now, hair, and I'll tell you, I mean, this is where it's really important for me, you know, being involved up front and seeing this. I remember many years ago we were having a lot of issues with hair, and I thought, where where is hair coming from in this process? And it turns out that we were wrapping um, most hospitals. I'm sure you've seen the blue or the green OR towels, and they were wrapping all of our trays in the towels. And these towels were being laundered by an outside vendor. So it turns out that that vendor was also laundering mops. And it turns out that they put everything into an industrial you know, washing machine. So not being in the room and seeing all this hair on these towels and not knowing where they were coming from and where they were getting laundered very quickly, we stopped using that stuff. But still hair develops. And actually for this, you know, I was curious as to, well, you know, hair, you know, it's sterilized and I wanted to look more into it. And I'm not sure anybody... You know, in the audience, you may know more than I do about this, but I was kind of curious because hair is a protein, it's keratin. Is it sterilized? I mean, it's been through the sterilizer. And is it sterilized and is it contaminated? And most of us would believe that, yes, it's contaminated. Surprisingly, I could only find a few studies, and they were all performed in Turkey. Why that is, I have no idea. Um, but this was a study that they did looking at swabs of sterilized hair. So if they sterilize the hair, you know, what happened? And they swabbed all of these hairs and what they found, and it was only checked at 24 and 48 hours, was there actually was, you know, no growth. 
Still doesn't make you comfortable though, especially because when you're dealing with infections like P. acnes, um, which cannot grow in the lab typically up to 14 days, that wasn't super, super helpful. You know, they still said, although it wouldn't increase the risk of biological burden, it wasn't recommended to be used if you saw that when you were opening for a case. And this was another study, again, also out of Turkey, and they looked at the reasons for cancellations of these elective surgeries. And 14% of delays and cancellations were due to operating room problems. These are real live problems that we're dealing with on a day-by-day -day basis, and it increases the anxiety. I mean, patients are already nervous going through an operation, and now all of a sudden the surgery is delayed or canceled. It's like, you know, when you're on the airplane, and you're sitting on the tarmac, and they have to de-ice it two more times, or they have to come out to a you know, work on the brakes before you take off. Everybody's anxiety level is going to be a lot higher until that plane lands wherever it's going. But even though that they said, you know, maybe sterile, they did conclude the presence of hair in the sterile package, the surgery needs to be canceled. So whether or not we're seeing holes, whether or not we're seeing um, bio burden, cement or bone or hair, you have to be concerned about the risk of infection. And then splash patients. I really wanted to talk about this because, um, you know, this is something that I've seen come and go over the years. And as far as our infection studies, honestly, it's, it's quite hard to prove with statistical rigor. Luckily, because infection rates are so low, you know, we're seeing infection rates in the 2% or less category in joint replacements. So st to statistically prove that something does or does not cause the infection is really hard. You need hundreds of thousands or millions of cases. So we have to do based on best evidence, you know, what we believe. And, you know, the idea now is to have these ideas of a dry basin because in the past, you name it, it's been tried. You know, initially it was the, you know, the just the wet splash patients in the back and everything went into it and it was pure saline and people thought, oh, this isn't good. We should add antibiotics. You know, should we add ANSEP? Should we add Banco? Should we add chlorhexidine? Should we add iodine? Should we add bacitracin? And there's even some new biofilm agents that break down um, as a surfactant to clean these things. And then you have to ask, well, what is the risk of that then going back into the body? So the problem with a lot of these agents that may actually clean the instruments and prevent bacterial issues is that if they go back into the patient, they can be toxic. So that's a big concern. And when you look at cultures and you look at, and this is the whole reason, I mean, this is an old study in the 80s when we even first said, hey, I'm not sure these splash basins are good ideas. They went back and they cultured the splash basin at the end of the case. You know, and you're looking at almost three quarters of those had positive cultures. Staph epi is the most common bacteria that we see in surgical site infection. So it's not surprising that staph epi was the most common, but more than half grew more than one bug. And what they concluded even back then was implants should not be placed in the splash basin and the instruments placed in it should not be returned to the operative wound. Um, and there's also another committee, this international committee, and they, they deal with MSK infections. And this was data that came out. And, and again, it, it kind of alludes to the point of we have difficulty proving with statistical rigor, you know, does the use of a splash basin increase the contamination of the instruments and the risk of surgical site infection. And the recommendation was unknown, but based on the available data, the data of these fluid filled splash basins having bacteria, they did not recommend using those in that fluid issue. Now, where does that fit into today's talk and today's lecture? Well, the issue with SPD was we were saying we have trouble cleaning it because the instruments have dried, caked on blood and bone. So then they wanted to go back to using splash basins. And it became this back and forth of they were having issues on the back end, but we're concerned about infection risk on the front end. So honestly, I don't have the answer for you. You know, you have to really look at your hospital and your issues. And for me, currently, although they want it back in the splash basin in my room, we don't do that. We lay them on the table. They can go in the splash basin at the end of the case because I don't want to use, you know, a brooch of some sort and then have to go back a size. But that now has been contaminated in this splash basin. So at the end, they can wash it and then hopefully that makes it easier to clean on the back end, but we don't want sitting it in this little cesspool of bacteria. If that instrument I may need to put back into the patient could increase the risk of contaminating the wound and causing an infection. So 
you know, all of that information, you know, I think probably most of you, um, and, and I really kind of applaud everybody taking their time here on a Saturday because what I find from a lot of these talks, you know, in, in our world is when you look around the audience, and obviously you're in your own place right now, so you can't look around at the other people, but usually it's the people like you that want to learn more. And you probably all work with people that you know could learn a lot from these types of educational formats. So my hope is that you can then take this information back and share it with those people that you really think need more of this information. But I also want you to understand what happens on the back end and why what you do in SPD is so important. Um, and this really comes down to your hospital because in a lot of hospitals, if someone books a hip replacement or a knee replacement or a shoulder replacement or a big spine case and you bring in all of these trays and the vendor brings in three or five or 10 trays and there's only one set and those trays are contaminated, the case is canceled. You know, the surgery is canceled. We can't proceed because I need those instruments. And at that point, the operating room sits empty. There's a loss of revenue by the institution and the provider. And most importantly, the patient suffers from this delay. You know, you have to say, I'm sorry, the case is canceled. You know, we don't have the instruments that we need to do your surgery. But imagine if the assumption was that these things were gonna be clean and sterile and the patient was already under anesthesia, or maybe they had a block or a spinal placed in the pre-op holding area, anticipating that they were getting ready to come back in five or 10 minutes. And now you have a patient who's blocked or under anesthesia that you have to wake up and say, I'm sorry, you know, your surgery is canceled. So that becomes a big, big deal. What if you're at a bigger hospital? Like for us, you know, one of the knee systems I use, we have four sets. So if I open the first set and it's contaminated, then we walk over to SPD and we get that tray from another set. Now, the case is delayed by a period of time. Um, so the OR sits empty again. Um, there's a little delay in anesthesia. If they have a block or a spinal, this cuts into that spinal time or the block time of that anesthetic. And then the other question is, do we have multiple cases that day? And was that tray that was needed for the second case that we used for the first case, can that be turned over in a timely fashion to not have another delay on the next case. Now, what if the tray is contaminated and there is no backup tray? That was the only set of those vendor trays that we had. Uh, you have to ask, you know, can the surgeon switch vendors? Um, most of our partners, we don't like to, but we're pretty comfortable in the sense that if I have to switch from vendor A to vendor B, I can, but is the rep available? And are those implants here that day? You know, we usually keep all the implants in the hospital, but if your hospital doesn't have the implants, can the rep be called and can the implants be brought over? And then how does it affect patient outcome? You know, we know that there's pretty good data that doesn't show that one implant's better than the other. But if we were planning on matching the other side and now the patient comes back to the office and sees the x-ray and wonders why, you know, the right side looks different from the left side, and we have to go through this process of, well, you were scheduled for surgery, but the implants were dirty, so we just switched to a different company. And if they do fine, it's probably not a big deal. But if there's any issues, you know, all of this becomes a big problem and a big issue. The big, big concern, though, is what happens if it's not recognized? So what happens if the tray is contaminated and it's not recognized and the surgery goes on? And then towards the end of the case, you're past the point of no return. It's recognized that there's bio burden in the tray or in the instrument that we used in the surgery. What's the risk? You know, what is the chance of that stuff causing an infection? So we have to get infectious disease involved. Do we get risk management involved? Now do the, does the person go on a longer course of antibiotics and how does it do for the patient's experience? I mean, you're trying to let this patient know that there was a problem with the instruments and now we're going to wait and see whether or not an infection develops and we're going to have to watch them carefully and put them on antibiotics. And then possibly in your county or state, you may have to, you know, could this certain agencies involved so they're aware of the problems or mistake that occurred. So I think the biggest thing is that everybody has to work as a team. Um, you know, I've been in practice now close to 20 years. Um, I've seen a lot of managers come and go. I've seen a lot of techs come and go. There's been some really good ones and some really bad ones. And there's been a bunch that I've learned a lot from. Um, you know, this was, I don't know, some of you may recognize this is the Alvarado leg holder. It's a fairly older device. And 
it wasn't until I found out from another tech at another institution, yeah, you know, those were recalled. And luckily, the management team that we have right now is great. You know, and I said, hey, did you know this? We didn't know. Called it that afternoon. All of a sudden, the, the rep came in. We looked. We figured out which ones were suspect. They were pulled. By the end of the week, we had brand new ones. So they're working as a team. I also had a tech that was aware of the filters, um, the little uh, O-ring gaskets on the Ascolab hard pans, and she had recognized that a few of them had cracks. I didn't know about it. No one had ever taught me. She was the first one that brought it to my attention. This was years ago. And we went back. We pulled all of them, looked at all of the O-rings, and probably pulled out 50 you know, that were, um, that were broken or, or uh, damaged, all new ones the next day. And this is you know, the SBD team working with the OR techs, working together to let them know, you know where the problems are lie. Because I look at this as there's defense and offense, but it's both ways, right? So your SBDs, your defense, they're, they're working to prevent infection. You know, the OR techs are working on offense, so they're also going to be aggressive in cleaning off cement, cleaning off bone, but they play on both sides. So they can go back and forth between offense and defense because the goal of the team is to prevent infections. And they have to have this share of information because if nobody knows you know, where the problems are arising, it's really hard to fix it. Also getting your reps involved. So this is a complex reamer that some of my partners use. And there's a big issue because if the rep isn't involved and the techs know this was supposed to be taken apart before it was sterilized, but the last person that used it didn't take it apart and it went to SPD and SPD didn't know it had to be taken apart and they sterilized it. And then it comes back again, case canceled, or do we have a backup? But the other problem arises it who wants who to take it apart. And we're talking about all instruments, not just this one in particular, but you know, if SPD expects the team in the room to take it apart, they have to know that. And they have to know which trade does it go back into. And then SPD has to know those parts all go together. So they get sterilized and that part A and B don't get in this tray and C and D go in that tray because if you open up the tray and it's missing a part, how do you know where the other part is? So again, case is canceled. But even cannulated, we see this a lot in the, the tibia fracture, femur fracture um, world where a lot of these uh, larger drill bits are cannulated and sometimes those guide pins get incarcerated. So you know, tech in the room couldn't get it out doesn't tell anybody, goes back over to SPD. SPD doesn't know it's incarcerated in the reamer. Maybe they don't look down the hole and it gets stuck. Or there's bone and nobody passes the device down to clear the bone out. Now it's opened on the field. We go to put the, you know, the cannulated drill bit into the bone. You put the reamer over the drill bit, bone comes out the back. And you know, all of a sudden, everybody goes bonkers and crazy. So you have to know where those issues can arise um, and which part of the team is going to be responsible for taking it apart, putting it together, and how your SPD works as a team to make sure that none of those parts get misplaced. Because you don't want to have three of those parts go in and one get held out because there's still bio burden on it, and then the other three get sterilized, and now you're stuck because that other piece, who knows where it is? It's off in la-la land. Work with your reps. And this is the big thing on the right here. You see, this is uh, just a number of pictures of stuff that has popped up. So, you know, for a spine instrument, you know, you're reaching back, you get some bone incarcerated in there. Maybe the tech in the room doesn't notice it. The other one's a punch for a knee or a rasp for a, a hip replacement. You know, all spots where, hey, we caught bone on this. Let's make sure everybody's aware this week to make sure that you're looking at these instruments. But work with your reps. You know, if you have repetitive issues where the same instruments over and over and over again are being contaminated with bio burden, you know, have your rep break down the tray and make sure that these pictures are up in SPD. So even if, because this is what I hear, we just hired a new tech. They're fresh out of tech school. They're not very experienced. Great. I understand. This is where they're taught. So as a manager, you know, this is the job to sit down and go, hey, in this tray, you know, you got to look at everything. But these are the common offenders. And this is what we're looking for. So if they have the cheat sheet up in front and it says, you know, vendor A, hip replacement or vendor B, knee replacement, and they can look at the pictures and say, ah, I have to look more carefully at these instruments because these are the things that most commonly will have bone or cement attached to them. They start to learn very quickly. And if any of you have, you know, worked in an operating room with a very seasoned tech, 
you know, it's a lot of muscle memory, but, you know, our good techs, I mean, the lid comes off and they just know exactly where in the trade is. They're looking really quickly at, oh, these reamers, this, they look at this drill bit, and then they'll check. They're, they know where the problems occur. And you want the same understanding to be in the SPD department because that's going to prevent something from going into the sterilizer without being cleaned appropriately. This is that little O-ring that I was talking about on those ass flat pans again. You know, making sure that we're looking for that they're not damaged, cracked, or um, or not safe enough to use. But people have to be open to suggestions, and I'm sure all of you working in the healthcare field have dealt with this. You know, you got managers who aren't listening to the end users. You know, people in SPD or people in the OR saying, "Hey, we need this," and they're like, "No, you got to deal with what you got," or "We don't have money. It's not in the budget." And the hospital administrators and managers, you know, if any of those are in the audience, you have to listen to these people because these are the people that are dealing with this day by day. You know, and hopefully everybody in healthcare should have the same goals, taking care of the patient. And I think a lot of times people get more fixated on their, their little portion of that budget and their tiny portion of the job that they see as important to make sure that they look good to their superiors and they really forget the overall picture is to make sure that we're keeping our patients safe. So if you need better trained staff, you need to raise your rates. You know, you hear that all the time where, oh, the, the hourly rate at this hospital is really low, so people with no experience come until they get experience and then they go to the hospital down the street where they're paying them more per hour. Well, the hospital that keeps paying people the lowest is gonna keep having the least experienced people in a really important department and they're gonna keep having problems. You know, if you need lighting, that was, I think, years ago, we had a new manager come in, and one of the complaints from SPD people were that they couldn't see well. It's a simple fix, right? You hear that if you were the CEO, if they came to you, be like, that's easy. We're going to put lights in today. But if you don't hear from the end user what the problem is, you can't fix those issues. And if you need new equipment, you know, getting better equipment in and some of these ultrasonic devices to clean off the debris or bio burden is an important thing if that is one of the issues that continually plagues the problem or plagues your SPD department, which is leading to the risk of infection in your patient. And that's what I always try to, you know, tell people at all these meetings, you know, when they, they try to nickel and dime and they look at the budget and they look at the quarterly revenue is that, you know, again, if it's $100,000, if you're only worried about the money, you know, buying an instrument, you're potentially preventing a number of these infections. But the risk on the patient, you know, is infinite. I mean, you can't imagine the morbidity, mortality, anxiety, risk of death and poor outcomes from one infection. And if you can potentially decrease that from occurring by buying better equipment, hiring better staff and making it a better and safer work environment, that's really important. Um, the last thing is, you know, and, and this isn't so much with um, with bio burden directly, but indirectly. And this is the idea of optimization of trays that, you know, for many, many years, I've worked on trying to make our trays as lean as possible. And the idea being that if you have surgeons that only use 50% of the instruments in a tray, getting them to work with SPD and figuring out what you don't need and pulling them out, just imagine all of the potential benefits of that if you haven't already done this at your hospital. Because, you know, number one, the tray's lighter. Number two, you bring it in the room and the person's setting up the instruments, it's quicker and faster. Next is at the end of the case, if you're putting the instruments back, there's less stuff to clean. And when it heads over to SPD, there's not as many things to check and clean. So by optimizing these trays, you not only decrease the weight, but you decrease setup time, you decrease cleaning time, you decrease all the potential issues and allow time to be spent in other places in that entire process where other issues may arise so you can prevent bio burden and other things like that from developing. So, you know, just getting rid of the junk. Um, so, you know, all of that sort of in a nutshell, um, it's, it's a lot of information and I'm sure hopefully most of you know that, you know, I'm hoping that everybody was able to kind of take away, um, you know, one or two things that you may not have thought of or even if it's things that you thought of, but you weren't able to get across, you know, the goal line that you can take back to your institutions and share with the teams there. And that the hopes that you can kind of prevent any of these bio burden whole issues from developing and prevent a surgical site infection. Um, so, 
you know, now I guess I'll go back and if you guys have any questions, we have some time and I'd like to answer any questions that you guys have. All right, that was excellent. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, we do have some comments. We have some questions. I'm gonna scroll through here and um, let's see. The first one actually that we've got has to do with the recall on the Alvarado knee positioner. Someone asked about that recall and where they could learn more. Who who should they go to for that? So um, the, the vendor for that is Zimmer. Um, and then I think I probably somewhere have the uh, like the PDF. I, I try to save all of this stuff in a file, but I would start with your Zimmer rep. Um, and the issue that arose uh, with that was the mainly the boot and the boot, the weld and the old designs. So if you look at your boots and go around the, the bottom of the boot, the weld is supposed to go all the way around. And what happened is in the earlier models, the weld was only on the sides. And the idea was that bio burden can get stuck underneath the foot plate and below the boot where it could not be clean. Um, so if you go back and look at your boots, you know, if the weld's all the way around, you probably have the most up-to-date safe one. But if you notice that the weld does not completely enclose the bottom of the boot, then you may have one of those Alvarados that's suspect. But I would talk to your Zimmer rep. They were really great. I remember when we called them and they were in literally like that afternoon, um, had pulled everything that afternoon, you know, and it was with the hospital and, and probably a little bit of my email pushing and, and kind of you know, email screaming about this issue. It, it was fixed and eradicated pretty quick. We had new ones in a couple days later. But yeah, check for the weld and talk to your local Zimmer rep. Cool. Um, in your opinion, should the OR and SPD require departmental rotations? And um, what frequency would be ideal for the different team members to, to rotate in the different departments? Um, you know, it's a good question and actually, um, it was the people that brought this idea up to me, you know, being in San Diego, uh, we have a lot of uh, veterans that have gotten out of the service. And it was those people that said where they work, that was part of their deal when they were in the service is they were rotating through SPD um, and then rotating um, through as a tech. So they they covered both jobs. And, and I think that is probably the best. I'm not sure in hospitals today, it's really easy to find someone that has both of those abilities. They, they can go back um, with all of the rules and regulations. And we've tried having SPD come and sort of rotate through rooms at the beginning and the end of the case. And I think it's a great idea in theory. I'm just not sure at the end of the day, being in the room and watching what the tech does a couple times is helpful enough. I mean, I think a lot of times it's almost overwhelming if anybody's been only in SPD and you've spent even one day in the operating room. I mean, there's so much stuff going on. I'm not sure it's really helpful, but I think if you don't have the ability to cross cover those two positions, I do think it's important to have these meetings and maybe at a monthly OR meeting of having SPD, you know, come up and talk about where they're having issues with what instruments are coming back with dried on blood or caked bone and what they're having trouble sterilizing if it's been sitting for too long. And then also on the back end, listening to the OR techs, you know, say where they're commonly opening trays and having issues and making sure that everybody's on the same page, that nobody's really calling anybody out, that it's more of an issue of, hey, I'm going to learn from you and you're going to learn from me and we're going to make both of our lives better and the patient safer. But I think that's more of a realistic um, goal would be having those monthly meetings of both teams together because they are on the same team. Excellent. That's a good, good suggestion. Um, well, someone else commented when you were talking about um, having uh, the rep being a resource for those people in SPD, if maybe there's not a tech there to help with the trays. What if the rep isn't familiar with the tray or what if they don't know how where do they find other resources if their rep actually isn't very helpful or knowledgeable? Yeah, I mean, the, the rep, you know, at least in the orthopedic world, I mean, the reps are supposed to know those trays inside out. So if you have a rep at your hospital that is not familiar with the tray, I would go up the chain to the local regional manager. Um, and I know it's, it's a weird sticking point, and that's the hard part. I think, you know, in, in everywhere in our world, right, but especially in the operating room, everybody wants to point the finger. It's not SPD's fault, it's the tech's fault. It's not the tech's fault, it's the rep's fault. Um, 
And even at our hospital, we go back and forth. It's the rep's job to put up the rep trays, but do they do it before it's cleaned or after it's cleaned? And it becomes this big battle back and forth. But the reps should be aware, you know, and, and at least in our orthopedic world, and I can't speak to the other, you know, surgical specialties, but they come in our offices. I mean, they know the instruments cold and clean, so they should know all the instruments. Now, the issue that may arise is they may not know um, where the bio burden occurs. So, you know, if that's the issue that you're alluding to, I think that's a matter of the reps having a good relationship with the techs and then together they could sit down. But I think most reps that I've dealt with over the years have a pretty good idea. And even just the other day, we were talking about a new hip set and it was the rep telling the tech and hey, make sure because where the brooch handle goes, it's a deep hole, you gotta look in that area. Um, so, so they knew that stuff. But if your reps aren't aware, I would go up to the chain to your regional manager and maybe your rep is new and maybe they do have to bring in a seasoned rep for a while to make sure that everybody's on the same page, but the reps should be aware. And I would really question that up the chain if your rep was not familiar with their own instruments. Um, as a surgeon, is there a situation that stood out to you as a pivotal aha moment that shifted your perspective on advocating for infection prevention and this issue? How would you advise other surgeons to understand the significance of their role in infection prevention? Oh, um, well, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think any of you guys that have spent any time with most surgeons realize that a little, you know, all of us have a little sort of um, OCD and, you know, we're, we're looking at everything. And on the flip side, you see surgeons that are completely the opposite. Um, you know, it's like the early surgeons, the late surgeons. I always say that, you know, you know, surgeons, you know, that show up a half hour late, everything gets, you know, running late in the room and they're never on time. And, you know, the other surgeons that are there waiting for the case to start. But I've even had surgeons when we've talked about things like this, they've looked at me, what, how did how did you know how to open a tray? Like, they don't even know where to start. Like, they don't even know which, which lid to pull off and which tab to take off. So um, I think a lot of that, luckily for me, came from my early experience in med school and residency. I just had really great mentors that were text in an operating room that really showed me those ropes. I think it's probably gonna be hard um, for you to you know walk up to a surgeon and say hey i think you need to be in the room earlier and open and look for this stuff but i think most surgeons are concerned about surgical site infection so i think if you could get them involved and say you know hey these are the things that we're looking for and almost put it back on them we're, we're asking you to let us know where you see this process in the room um, and making sure that people are on the same page. And also, especially if you have, you know, docs maybe that are complaining about turnover times. And you know, that's an easy thing that, you know, we've even had our department chairs like, hey, you're complaining. Adam's got a short turnover time. You're complaining why yours isn't as quick as his. Get in the room early like he does. And you could have someone in the room and see how hard the team works to open. And I think that's a great way of getting them involved. So when they see there's issues in bio burden, I think it's just one or two times where a surgeon sees bone or cement they're going to be involved. They're going to be aware. But if they're in the lounge and they're just told that they're not ready for the surgeon yet and will call you when the room is ready for you, they're just not going to be aware of these issues. So I think, you know, letting them know that, you know, come in the room, see what we do. And if they unfortunately experience, you know, one or two of these issues of contamination and understanding how that could affect the safety of their patient, I think they're going to be a lot more engaged at that point. I agree with that. I've seen it time and time again in the OR when the surgeons were aware of what was going on, when they knew what the issue was, they were suddenly able to help advocate for whatever we needed to um, make the process better. They weren't just sitting, like you said, in the lounge waiting for their case to start and having them as part of our actual team in the setup too was really helpful for us to be able to get changes done that we needed to have happen. Um, I have a question about point of use cleaning. Actually, we were talking about the splash basin. Um, mm -hmm. And with the emphasis on point of use cleaning, how would you recommend that with the no splash basin that you were talking about in your presentation? Yeah, you know, it's really hard. And I think, you know, in healthcare, there's a lot of, um, you know, so many cooks and, and we ran into this, you know, you get a nursing journal and then nurses all of a sudden come in with new rules on humidity and temperature. Um, you know, and then 
the, you know, this, this group of people want this done because it makes their job easier, but they don't have a good understanding of what happens on the other end of the spectrum and how that affects some other part of the process. You know, because I've said, if you want to do point of use cleaning, you know, and again, it, it drove me crazy to waste this much, but it's like, if you want clean point of use cleaning, it means you can have saline on the back table and every instrument that you clean has to be, you know, wet rag, clean out of that clean water, clean your instrument and put it aside, that wet rag gets disposed because otherwise that wet rag that now has the bio burden from the last broach or instrument now is contaminated, which means, you know, if you go through 50, 60 instruments, you're talking like 50, 60 laps, which would be the way to clean it. Um, you know, I'm really hoping that some of these new surfactant based materials that are not antibiotic based that have been shown to be um, not toxic on tissue, that may, and I don't know, but it may be something that you could put in a splash basin that prevents bacteria contamination. But that's always our fear is that the splash basin is an issue. And the question is, is there a way um, after the case to better clean those instruments before they head back to SPD? I mean, just my personal experience is it seems like every department um, in this past couple of years has had just a different viewpoint of where in the process it should be clean and whose responsibility it is and why. And I think as the surgeon is the end user, just my concern and from our data, which goes back decades, just so the risk of bacteria contamination is there, although no one's been able to prove this caused that infection, the fear is, so we don't want all that stuff going into that same sort of cesspool of the splash basin and you know, piece by piece cleaning throughout the case. Does that slow, does the point of use cleaning slow down the flow of the case for, for you as a surgeon? It depends on the tech and it depends on the case. You know, cause I find like days where I'm teaching, we're moving a little slower. If I have a fellow with us, you know, if we have a good tech, they have plenty of time. You know, if we're really moseying and especially if it's a, you know, a new tech or new hire, yeah, it can really, really get them behind. Um, so it's, I mean, we've, we've done every potential algorithm, you know, that I've seen that you could think of. And I honestly don't know what the answer is. You know, I just know that most recently when they went back to trying to use splash patients for cleaning, it was like, Whoa, time out. We're going backwards. We can't, we can't recreate the cesspool splash patient. We have to find a better way of cleaning the instruments piece by piece. Right. All right, changing gears a little bit. Can you share a little bit about how adhesions and inflammation contribute to post-surgical complications and infections when exposure to contaminated foreign bodies such as hair and lint enter the surgical site? That I couldn't. Yeah, I mean, it, we know that there's a lot of issues that we deal with with adhesions um, and stiffness and inflammation from the surgical insult and things like that. But, you know, as far as what exact mechanism and role the bio burden and the hair have, that, that I don't know. I couldn't answer that one. Okay. Um, when we only have one tray for a case, um, we sometimes might have a couple of cases different or especially orthopedic. That's what I'm familiar with. And there's only one tray in the entire state. That's that one. Um, what is the best way, in your opinion, to manage those cases when we only have one tray and to communicate um, that we have only one tray available? Or how do we really make sure that everybody's on the same page when we have a situation like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's important. And I'm sure that happens, you know, a lot more frequently, um, you know, than, than patients realize. And, you know, hospitals aware of, are aware of it. So for us, like if we're opening up a knee, and, you know, it's a knee that I use all the time. We have multiple trays. You know, my team knows and the nurse will come in and, you know, just kind of ask the tech, hey, are you guys ready? You know, we've got most of the stuff open. The vendor says, yeah, we got, we got two backup sets. We're good. That patient's going to roll in a little bit quicker. But when we're doing a big revision or something unique that we do only have that one set, that nurse does not go to get the patient until that set is open and verified. So, you know, you're making sure that all the instruments are clean, there's no holes in the wrap, and then we know now, okay, yes, we're ready to go. Um, but that's the time where you probably have to make sure ahead of time, you know, the anesthesia knows. So if there's a, a block or a spinal going in of some sort, that they're aware that, hey, you know, time out before the block goes in. And making sure the surgeon's aware that, hey, we're gonna wait to put the block in, or we're gonna wait to bring the patient back until we can verify the instruments. But that's the tray that probably should be open first. 
you know, you don't want to open all the other stuff and do all these things and then everything's ready and the last tray, which is the important one, is opened last. So we may pick and choose which tray we open in that setting to make sure that the important tray is ready and safe and sterile to go. Um, here's a question. It says, do you think having a sterile processing tech close a case helps with bio burden? Um, I think that might be an interesting, um, it might be an interesting idea. I mean, there's, there's so many variables. So for us, I mean, we know that the number of people in the room increases the risk of infection. So in the total joint world, there's pretty clear data that just shows that people shed bacteria. So the more door openings, the more people you have in the room during the case. So that question would raise the idea of, okay, the door has to be opened and somebody from stall processing has to come in to the room while the case is being closed. So that's a person, that's a door opening, that's a variable. You know, the question always is breaks. And, you know, if we're able to close and one tech can leave and go on break, is the other tech closing or the tech that was going to go on break, do they have time to start that breakdown cleaning process and bring the instruments that we're not using over to SPD? So I think it would be very dependent on your staffing um, and your OR and your SPD capabilities. You know, and the timely thing, I know sometimes when we were getting really backed up due to volume, you know, things were sitting longer. Um, and that led to more issues with getting them clean because the bone and the blood would get caked on. So in certain settings, you would say, hey, do we have time to bring a body over? But I think it would be a logistical thing of staffing. And, you know, how well could they clean it on the back table before it leaves the operating room? So it's, it's an interesting thought. I'm just not sure how the logistics would work. Right. Um, can you speak a little bit to something that those of us in the OR and in SPD don't actually ever see? And that is the patient after surgery. If they were to develop a surgical site infection, what, what does that do for the patient? What does that, what harm does that cause them? What can it cause them? Yeah, I mean, that's the hard thing. I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk um, lately, I think, you know, with the world that we're all sort of living through, there's been a lot more talk, I think, lately about, you know, stress and anxiety um, and resiliency and things like that across everybody's life at home and at work and things like that. So when you look at a patient who comes in to have a joint replacement, and that's that's stressful enough, you know, you're having surgery, you're a patient, you're having anesthesia, and you're expecting, although nothing's guaranteed, I think most people coming in for a knee or hip replacement or shoulder replacement expect to not have a complication. So if we see a patient that develops redness, pain, swelling, out of proportion, you know, usually they have left the hospital. Now they're coming back to the office. Now they're getting labs. So they have another office visit. They're getting in and out of the car. You know, a lot of times we'll take a swab or take a needle and do an aspirate of the fluid. A lot of times we don't know right away, you know, unless they actively have pus coming out of their knee or their wound, we're going, hey, I don't know what the bacteria is, but you have to go back to an operating room. So sometimes there is a lag and a delay in their therapy um, and in the process of getting labs and specimens. Then we know. Now you have to talk to the patient that expected to be doing rehab, you know, a week after surgery, you have to readmit them to the, to the hospital. You have to bring them back to an operating room. You have to open them back up. You know, and it's this huge stressor. They were looking at returning to work and their life, and now it always seems to be like a Friday night or Saturday. So the surgeon's coming in, the team's being brought back in. We have to open the wound up, wash it out. Sometimes all the implants are removed. Sometimes just the modular parts, like the plastics, especially if it's an early infection. But we close it back up. The wound has to heal, which is always more difficult because they've had two incisions in a short period of time. So now their surgery is compromised. They get indwelling catheters put in. So you're looking at six or eight weeks of IV antibiotics. That becomes a nightmare because of cost. You know, can they get it at home through their insurance? Do they have to go to a nursing home? You know, the pain levels go up. Now they have follow-ups with infectious disease and everything gets put on hold. So for a lot of these patients, you know, all their friends are better in two months or three months. And now two or three months in, they're just getting off their antibiotics. The knees and hips, they're always stiffer. They're always more painful. Um, and we're not even really sure. Sometimes the infections don't go away. I mean, with certain bacteria, our success is only 70%. So if somebody gets through that whole three-month process and they're still infected, now they have another operation or they may be on antibiotics for the rest of their life. So these are the people, I mean, they're one or two percent, you know, but one or two percent of a million in the U.S. is still a lot of patients that will all say, you know, I wish I never had that surgery. So it's really that big of a deal. 
you know, and in pay, you know, surgeons, there was a, there was a, uh, an article that was written recently about, it was a young surgeon, um, probably about a month ago, and she was talking about how she had a complication with a patient and how much mentally it affected her. And it became this huge thing that, you know, we wake up at two in the morning worrying about our patients, but it starts to affect every interaction that you do with every patient. You get nervous and scared, you know, and you're trying to do all these extra things. And I think a lot of people in the hospital that are involved in point of contact care aren't really privy to all of those things that happen on the back end if a complication occurs. So I'm really glad you asked because I always I always want people to realize, you know, when you're dealing with patients, like how important your job is, even though you may only see them for a shift. You know, we're seeing them forever. And when these complications occur, they're big, big problems, you know, physically, mentally, socially, financially. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think sometimes we forget that once they're out of the OR or once that instrument tray goes out of SPD, it's, it's, there's still a life that's on the other end of that. And that patient is living with all of that. And we have to be vigilant no matter what, what our role is, always vigilant to make sure that they are protected. And then, so I wanted to share. I was, like, was going to yeah. say, I was, I was just saying like, you know, when people start to get, they lose sight of that. I'm like, mm -hmm. just imagine your mom was having surgery yeah. in that operating room. You know, wherever you are in that process, you're going to do everything that you can to make sure everything is as perfect as possible. So your mom's surgery, that risk of a complication is as low as possible. And I think that's the yep. best way to look at it. You're absolutely right. That always puts it in perspective for me, um, for sure. You had a couple of just comments I wanted to share before we wrap it up because we're starting to run out of time. This has been so good, though. Um, Jennifer said, thank you, Dr. Rosen, for sharing your challenges on your side and giving emphasis to the SPD tech to be more cautious on handling instruments for patient safety. And um, Craig said that this presentation will help all ortho surgeons, and he's floored that you really want to know SPD's throughput and the attention you've paid to them. And then also, if you'll notice in the, in the Q&A comments for all of you watching, Lisa shared an article if you want additional scientific evidence um, to share with your teams. There's an article posted, published by Dr. Weba Truscott in the Journal of Surgical Technology International on the impact of microscopic foreign debris on post-surgical complications. So you can check that out if you want to. Um, let me go over here real quick. And all right, we are going to be finishing up this fantastic presentation. Thank you for sharing your insights and your solutions for improving the safety of orthopedic instrumentation. Um, all of you had great questions. There was a great discussion at the end. Um, if you have additional questions you'd like to ask Dr. Rosen, his contact information can be found in the speaker bio tool in the lower right part of your screen. Um, and also the questions that were in the comment Q&A, they will be sent to Dr. Rosen as well. So he will be able to respond to any that I may have missed. Um, but there will be a short 15 minute break before our next session. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. Thank all of you for joining us today. We will see you in the next session. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Absolutely.